Today we are pleased to welcome six panelists specialized in environment, biology and marine conservation. So the idea of an event about oceans uh, came up a few months ago when we met David Martin. Uh, David Martin is one of the panelists today and is also a professional diving instructor in Phuket. He published a book, he, he first created a foundation called uh, Oceans for All with Thibaut Salin, who is next to David Martin. And then together they published a very nice book with beautiful photos of Thai maritime life. You can find it on the first floor. And so thank you, David and Thibault, for coming to Bangkok. And congratulations for this very nice project. Today we are very happy to co-organize this event with the French Embassy and the French National Research Institute for Sustainable Development. Um, thank you for these two partners for everything you have done to make it work. And after the panel discussion, we will go to the first floor to inaugurate two exhibitions. So the two exhibitions, uh, they will be on display until October 12. And today, and only today, still on the first floor, you can also find a virtual reality experience. Okay, you can just, it's uh, downstairs next to the stairs. So I would like to thank you all for coming today. Thank you to the panelists. I will leave the floor to Dr. Pech Mano Pavitre. Uh, he will be the moderator tonight. Okay, so he, he will introduce the guest. Merci. And first of all, I have to say I'm not a professional moderator, so let, let's play it by ear and you know make it as informal as possible. So please, can you pick your seat? I, 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 uh, I asked the organizer already. It's okay to for the panelists to uh, take 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 off the mask. Um, so thank you again for organizer, and I think this is a very important topic that we will be discussing today. Uh, my name is Pet Manopovit, so uh, I'm currently a, a freelance researcher, but I have a long um, working experience with the coral and marine protected area. Uh, my PhD thesis actually focused on marine protected area network design to help increase the coral resilience of a uh, marine protected area in the Andaman. So I'm really pleased to, to, to help moderate this section today. And we have a very uh, distinguished uh, speaker from various fields. We have um, uh, Dr. Apple, uh, Dr. Shoshana Shawanish, uh, who's currently from the Department of Marine Science, Faculty of Science, Shivani Kwan University. I think you probably are familiar with her, you know, with the, with a very warm dress in the Arctic and Antarctic uh, exploration. So she'll be maybe uh, giving some experience on that exploration and how her first-hand experience about the climate change and global warming affecting the marine environment there. Um, second, also we have um, Ms. Tuni Sisekun Chaira, who is a 
program management officer at UN Running. So she's actually implementing the EU-funded Swiss Asia, which uh, promotes sustainable and um, sustainable consumption and production SCP and uh, circular economy in Asia. So I think that that is also a very important topic, um, and we'll be discussing about the issue of marine plastic, which I think everybody here nowadays every day. Uh, third, we have Dr. Christine Cabasas, a geographer trained in Sorbonne University. I'm very excited to, to learn more about the, the topic that uh, Dr. Christine uh, studied because she actually specialized on uh, coastal planning, especially the tourism development. I think we all know that Southeast Asia experienced um, very high development in the coastal area and I think that has been affecting the marine resources in a big way. So how we can do that better, so that would be very interesting. Um, fourth, we have David Martin. International and professional diving instructor who is based in Phuket. As uh, I think you have heard, so he has uh, he has helped co-found this um, non-profit organization called Ocean for All Foundation. So we will be all learning more about the, his foundation. Last but not least, um, Chin, uh, Mr. Sirachai Arun Rak City Chai. I think you have put uh, together a very nice exhibition uh, downstairs, so everybody probably has seen it already, uh, the truth from 2C. So he has been a, a very strong advocacy for change in terms of uh, marine conservation in Thailand through his work with uh, a lot of assignment and also work regularly with National Geographic Thailand. So uh, before I begin, I think um, today's topic is very important as you all recognize the state of the coral reef today. Earlier this year, you heard about the, the uh, mass coral bleaching in Great Barrier Reef. And in fact, it's actually the third mass coral bleaching in five years. And roughly about half of Great Barrier Reef now is dead. That's strong link between the impact of climate change um, to the fate of coral reefs. Scientists often uh, call coral reefs are the canary in the coal mine. Majority of coral reefs could disappear by 2050 if climate change impact is go unabated. So essentially what happened to coral reefs could happen to other important ecosystems. As a country, Thailand doesn't have huge area for coral reefs. Approximately, we have only about uh, 500 square kilometers of coral reef in both sides, so it's about half we found in Andaman Sea, about half in the Gulf of Thailand. But less than 10% of coral reef are in good condition. Yet, in a major study, Thailand is one of the top five countries that earn revenue from uh, reef-related tourism. So each year, we generated about $80 billion from uh, reef-related tourism. So in a way, coral reef plays such an important role in terms of livelihood provision and economic generation, probably more important than many has ever thought. However, coral reef degradation has been an important environmental problem we face for a long time. And the situation, I think, as we all know, as, uh, every speaker has experienced, is not getting better. Coral reefs still face multiple threats from unsustainable tourism, overfishing, coastal development, and more and more, evidently, a marine plastic. But the COVID pandemic, which has caused countless deaths and so much pain that has been felt across the world. But at the same time, I think during the, uh, during the COVID lockdown, Nature has proved how resilient it can be. Everybody has followed the news about turtle has been laying egg in record number this year. Both we have the little back turtle and also uh, hawkbill turtle in very surprising destination like in Samui and Phuket, which is a very uh, popular tourist destination. Marine in nature, like whale shark, also has been frequently seen. Shark population has rebounded in some places where strict measures like area closure has been imposed. So today, I think it is a great opportunity that uh, to really 
think about what has happened during the COVID and how we can use this opportunity to rethink about the way we develop, the way we use the natural resources. And I think we all agree that we have to do better. We have to think about new way of life, new way of development. We heard so much about the new normal, and I think today's topic is about the new normal, how to really save the Thai Sea and Thai coral reef. So I think that sort of the overview, and I think that was all we want to try to answer today. And we welcome the, the question and also interaction from the audience. So I'd like to start with the question about the impact of climate change on the oceans and coral reef. So we're going to start with the uh, introductory video to set the scene. My name is Claude Lorius. I'm a glaciologist. Through his activities, man is destroying the environment of the planet on which he lives. Global warming threatens one of the rare living beings that are visible from space. By building underwater walls, coral reefs are among the largest ecosystems on the planet. most biodiversely rich ecosystems, but also 
one of the most beautiful ones. So thank you for video presentation. Um, so I think the, the first session we want to explore and also you know learn learn more about the impact of climate change on the ocean and coral reef. I think the first question I want to go to uh, Ajahn Apple about because you have been to the both Arctic and Antarctic. So what have you observed um, concretely? How did the climate change have changed the way you understand the Thailand's ocean today? from your experience. Hello. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Pei. Um, actually, um, I had a chance to go to Antarctica twice and in Arctic uh, three times. And I have to say that every time since I've been there, I see a lot of change. For example, uh, sea ice get melting and melting. And each year, you not believe that sea level has rise at least about one, two, three millimeter a year. It seems to be small, right? But actually, scientists have predicted that if uh, in the next 80 years, I'm not sure whether all of us are going to be here or not, but in, at the end of the century, if uh, global you know, still warming, sea ice still keep melting, what happens is that sea level will rise uh, about or more than 10 centimeter, uh, 10 centimeter. So what, what it means is that many cities will be under the water. So, additional to the sea, um, sea ice melting, uh, what we can see is that, like in this picture, you can see the penguin very quick, like, but unfortunately, I have to say that right now, baby penguins are dying. And each year, 90% at least of baby penguins die because of sea ice melting, and they cannot get enough food. Their parents cannot get enough food. Not just only that, when we went to Arctic two years ago, what we saw is polar bear. You see that? What polar bear doing? They become a vegetarian. I, no, I don't think that polar bear want to become a vegetarian. But right now, they have to eat moss and uh, uh, grass. And the reason because of sea ice melting. So actually, uh, sea ice is act like a bridge for the polar bear to um, go to find, you know, that food which is uh, sealed. So um, when there is no sea ice, then they cannot go anywhere. So that's why they have to eat, you know, those um, grass and moss. Um, so actually, come back, uh, what I get from from the polar regions and how about time to Thailand. So actually, it shows that right now, climate change is really happen, okay? It's where it's happened. And in poor regions, unfortunately, they have been hit very hard. But for Thailand, I think we're still a little bit lucky. We not see any change or any impact much. But sooner or later, we will get hit the same as what happened right now in the polar world, Arctic and Antarctic. Yes, I think when we, when we talk about climate change, you know, the, the polar bear is a poster child of the problem. But I think follow-up question is also, what have you observed in Thailand in the marine environment about the impact of climate change that you have seen? Because I think for, for people, maybe outside academic, might not remember uh, 10 years ago, right, 2010, actually Thailand experienced unprecedented coral bleaching some of the places that also was my study site experienced like more than 90% of coral mortality, which I think is such a it's such a great effect that we talk about the polar region, but I think in, in, in Thailand also we started to see many impact already. But have you have your experience have you seen what the major impact from climate change? One of the major impact is also one of the you know important issue that we're gonna talk today is a coral reef. Coral reef, as many of you know, that they are very sensitive animal. So in the past ten years, you can see that um, many um, coral breaching phenomena 
happened in Thailand and around the world. And what, what happened with the coral after bleaching is that it made coral get weaker, weaker, and actually they can eventually die. And uh, from the uh, scienti uh, scientists they um, study, um, they said that in the next 30 years, I think we are still alive, in the next 30 years, if um, sea water temperature is still rising and global uh, you know, warming still uh, increase, what happened is that 90% of the coral reef around the world will be at risk. What does it mean at risk? It means that some of them probably going to die. And some of them going to almost you know, yeah, get them in danger. So in the next 30 years, I think it's not far at all. Does it look so hopeful? Um, and I, I think also ecologists and I think for the information from the government themselves, the Department of Marine and Coastal Resources, uh, read that, that uh, now coral in Thailand less than 10% that you know still in good condition. And I think I'm gonna open up for other speakers as well about what you have observed so far. Um, but start with. Uh, Dr. Apple, about the situation of threat of the coral reef, what have you seen? What has been going on? Well, talking about the threat on yes. the coral reef, actually, um, unfortunately, I have to say that coral reef have long been um, declining. Um, it's not just a you know, recent issue, but uh, but we, you know, uh, just recent concern about it. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, as just, you just mentioned earlier, it's a million, million of uh, dollar uh, that uh, uh, for the uh, country income come from uh, uh, tourist uh, industry related to the coral reef ecosystem, and that's why now we start to worry that well, if the coral declining and disappear, what happen um, going to be for the uh, country income? What about people in the field? I think, Chin, in, in your experience, about your, your working experience, what have you seen in the situation of coral reef? To reef, really? Uh, you know, uh, when we talk about the tourist industry here, I think one of the best examples is probably the Maya Bay or PP. Maya Bay, uh, okay, right now we have closed it, but in the past, I think like since the 80s, it has become the probably one of the top spot for seaside, coastal, maritime tourism destination, which like what the carrying capacity of the place is around 180 people per instance. But during the high season, the number of people is around 5,000 people a day. That's just like quite absurd. So in 2018, when they closed it, uh, I happened to get a chance to go there to photograph the shop. It's been the whole day I've been swimming in that bay, I can only find maybe one or two colonies of coral that looks good. Yeah, the rest seems like totally decimated. Just hope it can come back later soon. And another threat, I think it's like not only limited to Thailand, but also like this whole Southeast Asia region with industrial commercial fisheries with like non selective fishing gear like trawling. Like, they are like kind of everywhere. Like last year, I spent a whole year like working in Myanmar, working on my other story. But we have a survey that has just like recently been published. Around ninety percent of the survey site where we went out to see the the ghost net. Ghost net is like abandoned fishing gear. Ninety percent of the reef where we went diving, they have ghost gear there, and thirty percent of them has like multiple layers of net. And yeah, and that's cover stuff, lots of things done, not only coral, the fish, and the marine life, turtle. That's not only the damage to just the coral itself, but the whole ecosystem. So that's what I have seen. Hey, pass on. How about David? I mean, as a professional diving instructor, do you agree with the assessment about the current situation? Of yes, coral of course. Um, the problem with the climate change. Uh, of course, bleaching is the first thing that you can see visually, at least for the you know, 1% of world population putting a mask. 
and going diving or snorkeling. What, that's one of the issues. 99% of the world population don't put a mask for diving and snorkeling, so they don't know what's happened. That's, and climate change is not something local. It's not Thailand that creates climate change for Thailand grief. It's global. So it's not something we can do. It's the entire population in the world creating human activity, climate change that we see in Thailand. So now it comes to the fact that fishing also affects the reef because ghost nets, uh, climate change, tourism, meaning before COVID, a lot of people at the same place at the same time. So all those activities, which are human activities, are the result of coral bleaching, coral destruction. When the corals die, they become more fragile. They stop the wave less because they are less stronger. That means we have erosion on the coast. We have the, re the, the wave coming more into the mangroves when they used to be stopped by the reef. So all this affects uh, what we see today. And yes, now we have to move on on what to do, you know, solutions. I, I really like the, um, the explanation because sometimes, you know, when you talk about coral reef, people say that, oh, you know, the, um, with the climate change, there's no hope for coral reef, let's just give up because they, they are going to die anyway. But when you're looking at the coral conservation, actually, places like Thailand, the major threat is still the, uh, uh, a local human activity, right? So actually, there's so much we can do, so don't give up just yet. Um, and I think the, the point about the coastal erosion is also very interesting. If you travel in the, you know, in the coastal area in Thailand, the, the coastal erosion become quite a major problem. And as David mentioned, I think the study that, uh, uh, that showed the uh, uh, coral reef, the intact coral reef ecosystem can reduce the bad energy by like 97%, you know, when you lose the coral reef. I think the impact to the coastal community is quite big. Um, so follow on, during the COVID, we have seen, you know, we have heard so much about recovery of marine life. Have you seen any changes that you can see? Yes, actually. So in Phuket, uh, for example, the, during COVID, the most change was uh, in noise pollution. Because no tourists, no boats. So from thousands and thousands of speedboats weekly in the ocean, it becomes zero from one day to the other. So after a while, fish, big fish, it's like animals, imagine Africa, uh, cars running in the forest, then suddenly no cars, you see more monkeys and more animals. So underwater is the same. Big fish come closer to the coast when there is no noise because they're not scared. So when we go diving now in Phuket, for example, we see more whale sharks and mantas compared to before COVID. So this is a good thing because of the less disturbance from the noise and the surface. Uh, COVID did not bring less pollution, definitely not. Uh, the fact that because most of hotels are closed, they don't clean the beach, so there is more plastic coming to the beach. Every hotel at six o'clock in the morning, they clean their beach. So at least this is, but now everything is closed, not only here, Malaysia, Philippines, Indonesia, so all the tourism industry that stops actually Cosmetic-wise, it looks more dirty. Mm -hmm. what, what about Chin? I mean, you, you have done some that time during the COVID lockdown as well. What do you see in first hand in terms of changes? Uh, well, during the COVID lockdown, I did another story about like, in the city about the COVID in Thailand. But I would say that, uh, okay, I've been some out diving sometimes and keep following the news from the diving community. Uh, I think the how significance of the lockdown with the lack of people during COVID is we, we don't we probably can't say for sure how significant the effect is because the recovery of the well we, we can't actually quantify it but we cannot really observe like in many places let's say for Kolibong Island where it's the big, uh, probably the place with the largest population population of dugongs in Thailand they came back to the shallow water and in a huge number and approach can be easily approached. But for other other places like the recovery of like fish stock 
it could also be related to the change in our policy in the past due to EU pressure. So, yeah, it's quite hard to quantify, but yeah, the, the lack of disturbance might affect how the signatures are returning to, to use those beach that are often full of tourists for nesting to yeah, reproduce more baby turtles. But yeah, there, there, there are some effect with the lack of disturbance. I mean, one one thing you know, when you when you visit coastal town now, like I went to just went to uh, Krabi or Phuket, and also just seeing the news. But one thing that changed visibly is the water quality. I don't know, like you know, there's a there's a picture of Patong before and you know after COVID lockdown, and I think that might that might also means about the current situation of how water treatment, you know, the problem of coastal development has been affected the marine resources. I don't know, Dr. Christine, have you, have you visited this um, tourist town and what, what have you seen in terms of change during this COVID? <laughs> Yeah. Yes, I visited this, um, for instance, Koh Samui uh, in uh, these recent weeks, and that's amazing um, how the beaches and water uh, is so, are so clean, actually. And uh, while uh, I knew from other people, and I saw pictures uh, online uh, with uh, beaches hyper crowded and, uh, and uh, with a problem of waste, uh, solid waste, etc. So yeah, I, I, I've seen a big change, yeah. So I think that, that really highlighted about the way that, you know, how we did it wrongly in the past as well, how we really overdeveloped in many places, you know, the places like, uh, I think, Phuket and Samui, when fully operated, we might actually overuse the resources in a way. And um, I think, that kind of, you know, lead, lead to the second part of the discussion about the direct human impact in terms of uh, marine plastic and uh, marine pollution. And I think we have an excerpt from the documentary Plastic Ocean that uh, maybe just to highlight the problem that we are, we are facing today. Far from where I live, the ocean is hiding from us another fact. The currents are dispersing our chemistry, the pollutants of our industrial creation across the whole globe. More than 46,000 plastic wastes per square kilometer on average across all the seas. What is killing these birds comes from my home, even though I live thousands of kilometers from here. We tip six million kilos of plastic wastes per year into the sea. Plastic which doesn't decompose, but which microfragments. What these birds are eating, the fish will eat, and in turn, I will eat, as we delve into the ocean for our fishing, for our fisheries. Polluting the ocean to this point means poisoning ourselves too. I think plastic ocean, there hasn't been, you know, any um, better time to address this because uh, public awareness is so high. Um, and one thing, you know, you, you realize about the uh, marine animal affected by plastic, 
But when actually when you're looking at the, the system like Coral Reef, I think the information from Chin is very uh, spot on about more than 90% of the reef that he surveyed in Myanmar cover with this um, ghost net. So even the, the, the ecosystem like Coral Reef also affected highly by the marine plastic. We have heard so much about the problem. We have seen that Thailand already started to, you know, to, to change uh, some of the policy. But um, now the, the question for the UN environment staff, what, are, what could be the, the, the viable strategy for Thailand to really drastically reduce marine litter? We have seen some of the positive uh, policy like uh, 7 Eleven stop giving away plastic bag, but that's just like really a tip of an iceberg, you know. So there's so, still so much uh, problem that we uh, 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 struggle with. So I'd like to hear from Kun uh, Tony about, you know, what, what, what would be the strategy that we can solve this problem. Okay, uh, thank you so much. And first of all, thanks for the uh, French Embassy and the partners that kindly spend an evening uh, organizing this event because for me personally and even for organization uh, we look after environment global environment and ocean occupies more than 90 percent of, of the earth's surface so we are in the right direction that that we need to look into this issue um, as uh, the first uh, the, uh, a lot of um, the speakers has mentioned that um, we have created a lot of pollution Plastic itself is not a pollution, but after we consume, it becomes pollution once we leave it somewhere that it doesn't belong. For example, in the water, in the river, in, in the mountains, or in the, in the ocean. So that's when you turn the plastic that is a usable, convenient item to become pollution or waste. For us, we are now trying to, trying to look into uh, the way to tackle this issue from a different perspective. We are policy agency, so we have produced so many policy recommendations, many policy options. We even have a global program to look at the land-based uh, pollution before uh, releasing any pollution to the, to the sea. And that program has been there for like, at least two decades, but still it doesn't work. So if you look at the, the figure on the screen, this is the figure from 2015. And this is the first, a few first official um, figures that, that we recognize because it's so difficult to quantify anything that's floating in the ocean because ocean is open. And as it's so difficult to say, Thailand, how much have you released into the ocean or to the Thai Gulf? So this is like, they said majority of the marine litter, 80 to 60% is plastic. It could be some plastic that can be recycled, can be reused and can even be reduced before it was produced, but we still produce it because we, we want convenience. And the three major sources of plastic pollution is first from the land base, as I mentioned, second from the direct dumping, especially from the tourism uh, industry, either from the cruise or on the coastline, and even from the small boat. And last is the fishing gear, that includes both illegal and legal, and that has been abundant from the vessel or the, from the fishing boat at the, uh, even the uh, small-scale fishing. So it, it's, it can be waste somehow. Next, please. So these are the recommendations that we go through scientific um, evidence-based uh, process. We go to consultation, we go to participatory process to get this kind of uh, recommendation. And this is not the only one. We have produced so many through all the many processes that ever we have done. And if you look at it, people like us in the room, at least on the stage, will fully agree, fully understand, and we keep doing it. But what happened was, people outside the room, people who are not divers, who are not into this issue, they would never connect themselves to all these things. They would just say like, okay, this is about ocean, this is about coral reef, there's nothing to do with me. So UNEP has developed another sort of like principle to connect people that you are a part of all pollution and this is the solution, but it's not one size fit all solution. So next please. So we introduce something called sustainable consumption and production that we connect you as a consumer, 
and as a producer. That you can look into all environmental issues from the different perspective. Under the SCP, we have a lot of principles. Let me take only three. For example, like eco labeling is the tools that producer can help us educating consumers to make a better decision. What is in here? Where is it from? And how is damaging the environment? That's one tool. Second, waste management. I'm sure people here at least you heard about three R's for at least 20 years. And now we start introducing the first R, which is refuse. Refuse before you know why you want it. Refuse before you know that it cannot be reused, it cannot be recycled. And then we continue with the normal three R's that we have reuse, reuse, and recycle. And then we promote circular economy to make sure that there is no waste in the world. Before human exists in the world, there is no such a waste. Output from one ecosystem is an input to another ecosystem. So we want to make sure that we maintain that wisdom that it happened before human, like uh, with the development. And last, we promote sustainable lifestyle because actually all consumers have their own decision power. It's you who make decision. It's not me who force you to consume. And it's you who can make a change because we also want to promote uh, market-driven, demand-driven, that consumer refuse to consume or purchase some items that are not environmental friendly. Next, please. So uh, this is an example for Thailand that uh, one agency has tried to uh, look at the plastic straw. I chose this because plastic straw is one of the three items that the government is targeted that by I think the end of this year or early next year will be eliminated. One of the three is the plastic straw and, and these are the quick survey and these are from the relief, one of the mm, our <laughs> monitors network that this is the campaign and I think um, now these days people are not so much into law and enforcement. They want encouragement, they want promotional uh, methods and they want to feel that they have contributed something. So this kind of campaign, I think it works well if you expand the last two sentences in Thai that if you want a straw, please ask from the staff. And I hope this can be a starting point for us today. At least after we leave this room, you refuse to use straw. Because it's the first item that I think is the easiest to get rid of and it doesn't add on anything after you, you use it. So that's one of the message. And the last slide that I have is the campaign on the straw from different parts of the world. They give out information, they educate the consumers to make better decisions. So you know, we are promoting this kind of uh, awareness raising so consumer can drive the decision and the producer will follow what the consumer would want to consume. Thank you. Thank you. But um, so policy, why do you think Thailand is on track? Because also the government um, launched or formed the roadmap, yeah. uh, Thailand roadmap to address the plastic issue. What do you think about the roadmap? Actually, we also help government come up with some of the milestones. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that time, we look at the, the whole national uh, waste strategy and we highlight plastic. And I think 2018 is a big hit that the World Environment Day theme was on big plastic pollution. So the government said, okay, now it's time for us to, to, act, to take some action. And they took it up and they do the internal consultation uh, with many stakeholders and they come up with the three items that they want to get rid of within two years. So I think at least um, we are on the right track. Maybe it's a bit slow too slow for some people like us who really want to make a change, but at least it's, I think it's better than nothing. And even the plastic bags, it's more difficult to give up compared to the straw and compared to the single-use cup because uh, there are some needs of like people in the rural area that they want hygiene, so a single-use cup will still be needed, but, but straw is the first one. And it's the lowest hanging, hanging fruits to me and to many of you. And I think another thing that the Thai government has done so well and the minister himself announced in the World Environment this year is he will revisit the, um, the opening of the national parks. 
Now they encourage all the departments, the State Department of Coastal and Marine Resources, to do carrying capacity of each national park. And he will try to come up with a plan that which national park can be closed for two months per year. So I think at least uh, the, the minister and the, minister, uh, the Monterey's team, now they start um, understand how to communicate to the non environmental people and make sure that these people engage and understand why they develop such a policy. Mm -hmm. Any, anyone like to jump in? Yep. yep. Yeah, it's quite interesting. Uh, yes, that's why I was probably on the phone because uh, uh, a survey from this year it shows that Thailand is the, the leading countries in terms of the awareness in plastic with the 80% 80, 80 of the population with the world average at 15% of the population. Mm -hmm. I think like yeah, throughout last year we have like become quite far. And something that I find rather interesting is uh, based on a study by Jump and et al. On, uh, from 2015 about the global plastic in the world's ocean. When you look into the number quite closely, the plastic usage per population of Thailand is not that high comparing to the top on that list. But the main problem is still lies with like how we manage the plastic, how we manage the waste. And Oh. But that's quite, quite interesting, the, the figure that Chin highlighted. But my, my point is that, you know, no matter how high your awareness is, but it doesn't reduce the plastic waste, right? Mm -hmm. Because I think if you're looking at, especially after COVID, the number of uh, waste has actually increased. I don't know if Ajahn Pan has any comment, mm -hmm. because one of the models that I always admire is the Chula Zero Waste. It's the kind of the, you know, the area-based initiative, and they use multiple approaches. They use economic incentive, they charge the fee for plastic bag, for example. They do campaign. Um, I don't know if we can, how, how we can scale up the in initiative like that, you know, as a national level. That would be very effective. What do you think is a major, like, key strategy that we can reduce? Well, actually, um, is that we have to start, you know, uh, changing our behavior. But before I can get to that, many people probably curious that why really we have to care about the plastic waste, right? Yeah, yeah definitely is impact to the nature environment. But I think some of you already know. Uh, I always say that whatever the plastic waste that you throw away now, actually now you get it back through the microplastic form. And do you know that? Uh, we get this microplastic through the food that you eat, through the air that you breathe, and through the water that you drink. And actually, hope you don't mind, I will give you the number, which is a real number. Scientists already calculated that each of us, each of you now, have at least 10,000 microplastic in your stomach now. If you not believe, after the end of this seminar, you can go back home and try to, you know, see whether it's... <laughs> but, well, average, it really depends on the behavior of, of you, you know, in terms of food situation. So it's quite scary now that, well, uh, it's not just only affect the environment. Now it's getting closer, closer to you. And just two weeks ago, um, the study just came out that the plastic, microplastic, is not just only for uh, can be found in your stomach, but it's already in your liver, intestine, you know, and, and other organ, um, organ in, in, in the human bodies. And um, I think, um, well, if you know about that, I think it's, we need to do uh, something. Um, we cannot deny that, um, uh, well, we probably cannot really, you know, make it, you know, zero microplastic. But at least it's better to do something, not to increase more microplastic. Uh, so get into your, um, uh, your, your, your earlier uh, question to that, um, uh, well, the rule, the law is good, but eventually it's up to individual uh, to do it and uh, to change it. And the important thing, as Adam already mentioned, Start right now today, change your behavior first. Okay, you don't have to think about the root at all. Okay, um, and that, that is my uh, mm -hmm. uh, comments.
come to Dr. Christine. Yes. And also maybe highlighting about, because you're, you're really specialized in terms of coastal planning. And I think that's really spot on as well, because when you don't have the waste management in, you know, plan in the coastal town, that's really producing direct impact, because a lot of uh, marine litter would just leak out to the ocean. Yeah, exactly. I wanted uh, to come back on a few points that have been made. Uh, so uh, we talked about numbers, so number of tourists. And uh, if we consider Pattaya in pre-COVID situation, uh, the Pattaya used to receive something like uh, 14 million tourists, both uh, foreigners and uh, domestic. Uh, Bali is about the same number. Oh, yeah. uh, Koh Samui, if I'm not wrong, it's 2.5 million. Uh, Phuket. Five or six million. Okay, yeah. So you see, I mean, the, uh, these are big numbers, and this is why I'm highly interested in this uh, kind of uh, major tourism or hotspot. Because if you want to develop tourism, it means that um, you have to take some measures, uh, a lot of measures. So I agree with you that the responsibility is with every one of us and uh, to take care of what we consume and how we do it. But <clears throat> to me, and in terms of territory planning, you need to, um, to expect to implement some services. I mean, they're really crucial uh, services for wastewater uh, treatment, for uh, solid waste uh, collection and treatment, for uh, public transportation, um, energy, uh, water supply, I mean all this uh, is, uh, are really a major uh, measures that we need. Otherwise, uh, and this is what we, I have observed for a long time working on coastal areas and also with a, a team of researchers, uh, one from um, Asian Institute of Technology, uh, Vilas uh, Niti Vatananon, and uh, Agum Wiranata uh, from Udayana University, and uh, we've made uh, research also in collaboration with the National University of Timor Leste, and um, and it was on uh, exactly on this topic: tourism urbanization confronted to a climate change. And we found out that uh, very few programs actually are addressing, I mean, scientific or uh, development program are addressing this, um, this specific uh, urban, tourism urban polarities. Uh, cities, you have plenty of works done on cities, uh, but most of the time, uh, the, the major uh, tourism areas would be outside of these programs. So anyway, and um, one of the conclusion was that the, most of the islands and coastal areas were lacking of these crucial services. Not exactly lacking, sometimes yeah, purely like, uh, lacking, and sometimes um, uh, the services were undersized, meaning that uh, it was just too many, too many waste to treat, too, too many energy to provide, too, many, too much water to provide, etc. And um, yeah, always running uh, late. So yeah, <laughs> so we, we can see behind us um, uh, a picture of Pattaya, and uh, it's useless to talk about the high pressure that we can have on the coastline. And uh, on, the, on the right, this is another picture uh, from a, Kuta, uh, a small part of Kuta Beach uh, in, uh, in, uh, <coughs> in Bali. And just to say that how governments are dealing with different ways uh, in uh, territory planning. Uh, South Kuta, for instance, or all Bali, you cannot find this kind of coastline. Uh, not at all, because in the 70s, they made the decision to, to allow uh, building construction only up to the size of a coconut tree, so more or less 15 meters high, and to allow construction uh, not within a 100 meters from the high tide line. So you ca it means you, you cannot build anything in this distance of 100 meters. 
and, and that's, that makes a, a difference. It's not always respected, but let's say. So, um, yeah, just to remind the high pressure we have. So, territory planning is really done for, for that. I mean, to take care of almost all. And, and we can see the, the, the other slide, yeah? Um, so, coastal erosion is one of the major threats. So, I won't come back on extreme weather episodes, uh, and climate change, etc. But the effects are real. I mean, we, we can see, I mean, any, anyone can see uh, on the field and these effects. And you can see these pictures uh, there. This is in Pattaya, uh, so in the middle, above and in the middle. And also here, this is in Koh Samui, uh, coastal erosion. And how people try to deal as they can but to, to deal with, uh, with this uh, coastal erosion. And what uh, surprised me still, uh, it's still to see, uh, you see on the left, this is Wahin, huh, you, you know, and um, how we still build so much to the shore, you know, uh, thinking that between the sea and the buildings, uh, that's always the sea who wins at the end. So it's, it's too close <laughs> to the shore. Um, and then that's useless to say uh, where this uh, picture was uh, shot, so on the right, uh, because at the end, uh, so this is a pipe for uh, wastewater rejection directly into the sea. And I've seen this pipe uh, in many places. So. But maybe just to follow, follow on, like, but what kind of policy that you think need to be in place to improve the situation? Because, I mean, when you see the picture like that, it's almost like it's impossible to turn the tide. But do you think it's possible? Yes, <clears throat> it's always possible. I mean, uh, we went far, huh? very far. So, but um, because all the places are not facing the same conditions. I mean, all food, for instance, uh, uh, our recent research uh, showed that the picture, the general picture is quite uh, dark. But anyway, what was interesting is that it's um, all the spots don't face the same uh, condition. And why? And the major uh, factor for us is about uh, governance, uh, go governance, uh, public policies, and it makes a very important uh, difference when you have governance, meaning uh, the, the mo different modalities of governance, huh? I mean the regulations of course, enforcement uh, of the law, and um, um, how do you share also the, go go the governance huh, with other actors than the decision makers themselves, but with the population and so on? And also, um, I lost what I wanted to say. Um, yeah, I mean, um, another key factor is uh, about leadership in all sectors uh, for everyone. But leadership makes a difference. I mean, if you have a decision maker who is aware of the local and global challenges uh, and uh, is interested in education, in innovation, in environmental matters, it makes the difference. So from what I've seen for a long time, governance is really uh, one of the main key. Uh, yeah. David, you were about to... Yes, I wanted to, to talk about the plastic as it was the, 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 what we were talking about. And from my side, with my foundation, we, uh, we work more with the public rather than with institutions and government. And, uh, uh, and um, one of the interesting um, things that we, we see is that we organize often uh, beach cleaning, ocean cleaning with the public. And one of the uh, most misconception that people have is that everybody thinks that everything comes from someone else. People on beach cleaning, they think that 
all we collect come from Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines. 80% of what we collect on the beach is local. It comes from here, wherever you're in Thailand or in the Philippines. It doesn't come from Australia or from Africa. It's local. People think that the ocean, someone else will take care of it. Someone else is polluting it. They don't think, they don't realize it's each of us. And this is what we have to change. Yes, the governments, the politicians, they have to act and do something. But if people continue to think that someone else will take care of it, it's not us, that will never change. We talk about the, the straw, plastic straw. Of course, it's very important. And I think today everybody wants to, everybody agrees to stop using plastic straw. Every hotel, every beach club, every restaurant in Thailand and mostly around the world stop using plastic straw. They have the bamboo straw. But nobody wants to stop eating fish because that keeps fish. Fishing industry keeps more fish than plastic does. That's a fact. I mean, plastic kills fish, but fishing nets kill more fish than plastic. So, maybe if we reduce our fish consumption, in addition to cleaning the beach and, and getting less plastic. So, it's not only what other people do, it's what we do that make the change. And that's what we're trying to make with my foundation. People understand it, that it's each of us that can make a difference, not waiting for someone else to do it. And plastic is one of the examples. Mm -hmm. Excellent point. Um, I just I, I like to go back to the picture that Dr. Christine showed. You know, in terms of the the scale of the problem that we are facing, and I think during the COVID now we're talking a lot about the the economic recovery should be concerning about environment. So you we, we have heard about the green recovery concept about you know um, we have to come back, you have to build back better. I think also. You know, really key work that um, UN agency has been promoting, um, and I think to me, you know, what what has been missing is the externality, right? All development in the past, we have uh, environmental impact, but no one re willing to pay because benefit is the kind of the highest stake when you're doing business. So, do you think the current situation, the COVID, the lesson that we learn from this uh, pandemic, will will increase the green recovery. Are you hopeful that are we going on that path or it's just um, daydreaming of you know the, the 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 development agency? Maybe Christine or Kenny? The concept of green recovery. Anyway about green recovery uh, let's see yeah? <laughs> because I mean uh, each time there was a crisis in the past, I remember very well from Indonesia and also from Thailand mm. after the tsunami. terrible uh, tsunami. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you remember that. I mean, uh, people said, people, I mean, decision makers as well as uh, people, mm -hmm. I mean, said, uh, okay, this shows how much we need to change things and to implement, uh, uh, to do it. it a new kind of territory planning to take care of what we're building on the shores. But I can tell you from Indonesia, especially from Bali, it has been just the opposite. So, mm -hmm. so uh, wait and see. But I would like also to um, highlight that um, uh, for me, the, one of the quality or, or the, the good point uh, of the, um, the, the COVID crisis was, we, we talked about that, huh? the, the, the already the, some kind of recovery from, from nature. Um, and uh, obviously we all noted the terrible impacts on the social and economic sectors. But another good point I've seen, it's about, and you will tell me that I come back to my point, a previous point, but sorry, I really uh, yeah, com com convinced on this, is that it um, make the people, it made the people realize how much public sector is needed. Uh, I mean, for for managing the COVID situation in uh, in uh, in Thailand, for instance, it was well managed. Public sector and the government was on the front line not the private sector, the public se sector. And I think that all the areas 
uh, especially uh, touching to environmental uh, matters, uh, need this uh, strong input uh, awareness, of course, but also strong input. Yeah. I mean, very realistic reflection, because I remember very well about uh, what happened to PP after tsunami. You know, it was all like this ambition about we have to leave the setback area, we have to build back better, but exactly what happened is the opposite, you know, there's more development before, um, I mean, after tsunami than before. Um, but still, you know, when, when you talk about green recovery, I, I always have like, uh, sometimes I'm hopeful that because it highlights so much about, I think, more investment that has need to be put in for environmental protection, right? Because be before, like, wastewater treatment, it's just, um, we under-invest in terms of environmental protection. As an agency that promote green recovery, Kuntani, um, because also, like, we see in, in the U.S., there has been talk about the Green New Deal, how we can, you know, set really high, high ambition, and recently, the EU has also just, just passed this Green Deal, um, sort of stimulus plan and also really high ambition about how to actually um, addressing climate change issue as well as you know promoting the, the more green investment. How, how do we get there in Thailand or even have that kind of ambition? Okay. Uh, for, for Thailand and, and as a Thai who live in Thailand during the, the COVID pandemic, I would think that this is an opportunity for us to live slower life and understand better what is going on. And, and if you can um, uh, spend more time understanding how actually nature can, new reaches us for all this year. The ecosystem services and everything can be communicated in a very simple language. We, you, you don't need to communicate with your colleagues or your friends or your family in the technical term that we are talking here. But we just talk about, see, when there is not many cars, on the road, we breathe better. And then you, you keep sending out these messages. For us, this is an opportunity for us to communicate in environmental issues and what would be a possible actions, the most practical one, that, that we don't need law, we don't need measures, we don't need um, a research, but something that close to you. So for us, uh, Build Back Better is actually an opportunity for people to understand this at, at the uh, individual level. But, but for the investment level, we keep repeating the messages that actually we produced in 2009 about green economy, that if the government increase investment only in this 10 sector, you can make a big change, a transformational change. So we keep repeating these messages to our uh, member states through um, the meetings that we organize with them, through the intergovernmental meetings. But for Thailand, uh, we have more chances to talk with the minister because the minister is very open and dynamic. So he actually agreed that um, the issues that has been discussing never go away. So it's a myth for us that how many years that we've been working in protecting environment, but the, the challenge are still similar, quite the same. So he said, okay, he will take up uh, many things and then um, for example, recently we met and then he talked about the e-waste uh, import of the e-waste e from uh, other countries. So he said he's willing to step into many people's feet and, and see how, how the change would bring so that people can see the impact of doing that. But there are a lot of challenges uh, in terms of business sector that uh, the recycling plants, they, are, they have many like um, uh, layer of, of discussion. So at least up front, he willing to. So I still have hope, a lot of hope with this government in the way that the environment will be mainstream and environment will be discussed on the table, not under table like other previous government that ever happened. So I think we are moving on to, to the, the third session and I think I'll try to really make sure that we have time to interact with the audience as well. Can, can um, I add something about yes, sure. COVID? Sorry about that. Um, I, I would like actually, would like you to, to look at an other angle. Actually, uh, during the COVID situation, we see increasing of the plastic, single use of plastic. And that shows that human is still human. 
we thinking about ourselves first. Is it wrong? I don't think so. We human, we have to protect ourselves. So what I try to share with you is that it's probably impossible to make you know zero juice plastic. You go to the um, medical area. Plastic is still very useful, useful in many many ways. But why we have a problem with this? It's because we did not really throw it into the right place. That is the problem, and because of the mismanagement. So I would like to share with you this angle. Thank you. Um, I like to add a little bit because I always uh, strongly believe that um, the producer, the one who produces so much um, plastic content, has to share more responsibility. Because sometimes you know we get trapped in terms of awareness raising and the, the responsibility of consumer, but actually the one who benefit from producing plastic has to share more. And I think that, that also have one of the missing policy piece that I think in Thailand we need to get to that. The, the, the EPR, the extended uh, producer responsibility, where you know the one who produce plastic container have to responsible for taking back and recycling as well. Um, so moving to the solution, I think we have the, the great video from uh, Ajahn Apple as well about uh, kind of, you know, solution and we'll be discussing after this short video. ความสวยงามเช่นนี้ทุกคนต่างชื่นชมแต่ไม่คิดที่จะดูแลมันฉันไม่อยากให้ธรรมชาติหายไปจากโลกใบนี้แล้วหรือเพียงแค่คนรุ
what we have just talked uh, before the meeting is, uh, I mean, Ajahn Pen Laboratory has had done some really cutting edge research, and I think one of the big question is whether coral reef will be able to adapt, you know, to the the changing in climate. Will they adapt in time? Are they really kind of, you know, destined to doom, you know, with the uh, to Celsius rising within, you know, the next 30 or 50 years? Just like to hear about the really kind of, you know, the current research and your, your, your own um, discovery. Oh, um, thank you, Dr. Pitt. Um, as you just see, uh, the real showing that um, we at the university have been working on a coral restorations. Uh, you know, you see, to a sexual reproduction for more than uh, 20 years, and it has been succeed very well. But one thing I would like to emphasize is that coral restoration is one of several ways for uh, coral conservation. Some people say that oh, we just restore, restore, not really restore. It's just helping the coral to come back faster. We so have to need several ways to do together. But talking about um, a new cutting edge that we found is that right now we necessarily just you know um, make the corals uh, um, increase more number or more population. But we have to aware too that we have a problem with the climate change, global warming, sea water temperature rising. So what we try to make sure is that the baby coral that we produce they can be stand or adapt to the environmental change that now what we are doing and so far it has been succeed quite that good. If you like to see them, how strong they are, you have to visit us in the islands, very nice island that you just see in the video. So uh, yeah, is what, it okay? Have, have, have you seen the adaptation that um, yeah. Carl be able to make um, with them? Actually, it's right. quite a new information. We haven't published yet, um, but I will share this secret with you. Um, it's like a, you know when you are raising your baby, right? Your baby will get strong or not strong. It really depends on how you treat them. If you, you know, uh, not not let them uh, play anything or you know face anything, then when they grow up, you know they may be more sensitive to whatever. That they, that, they, uh, that they face. So the same as the coral. Unfortunately, um, you could see the hatchery. Oh, hatchery, I always say that it's just one star hotel. We don't have a lot of money, so just one star. So what happened is that the temperatures in the hatchery usually is about two centigrade higher than normal seawater temperature. And those baby coral have to be like that, you know, through the high temperature for two years before we release them back to the oceans. And later we found that it's quite good because during the two years, if they cannot adapt, they die. But if they can adapt, once we release into the ocean, the water temperatures, you know, is less than normal, right? But when it's breaching occur, they can survive and they can tolerate with that. Mm -hmm. That's really good news and I think time and time again, later prove that you know they are much more resilient than 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 we we understand. But the point is we have to give them the best chance to to really um, to to adapt. Um, and I think one one point also that happened made very very good is that the restoration is important, but it's just part of the solution, right? I mean more and more private sector are very interested to invest or support the restoration work. But I think protecting the source, protect, addressing the, the, the same old environmental problem, I think it's something still the key. Um, we have heard a lot about the importance of public awareness to really kind of, you know, come up with the necessary policy change. And I think we have both David and Chin who work, you know, communicate with the public regularly. Um, what your take on you know the approach the the most effective way to engage public in this environmental problem and how we can really create this enabling environment for change um yeah sure David. i think the the most important is uh, knowledge uh, if people don't know there is a problem they can fix it they can help fixing it. So 
knowledge, awareness, communication is the most important today. Uh, people, for example, people think that the oxygen we breathe comes from the plants, the Amazon, they call the Amazon the lungs of the planet. Actually, 70% of the oxygen we breathe comes from the oceans. How many in this room knew that? One, two, three, four, so less than 10%. So, knowledge is very important, and I think the work of all of us is to inform the public about what happened in the ocean, why it happens, because again, less than 1% of the world population put a mask. Mm -hmm. So knowledge is key. What about you? Oh, well, by the way, for usually, I start my career off as a scientist, actually. I, I study charts, I study fisheries, but I find it hard to tell people about what's going on out there. Just, you know, my, my papers get published, and I don't think anybody here would get to read it. So that's why I start like, doing photography, and it has become, become a career, I think. For, for me, I would say photography is a very easy and fun way for me to reach out to the public to make science and conservation that seems to be something that is not like in uh, everyday life become more accessible, more like pop, more mainstream, more bubblegum, more vanilla. Yeah, so I think like, that's the way how these kind of important stories reach out to everyone. Well, but it's just a way to communicate that there's a gap to bridge the people and the consultant community to it wouldn't have make any difference to uh, like, the partic participation from you guys. Okay, I, I just like I just throw a quote in. I love any French photographers, but I'm gonna use the Virgin quote. Yeah, photography just cannot do much. It just can provide only just part of the information. It has no pretension to change the world. And it's like the people who read those photographs who change the world, and that's from John Wink, and I believe that is true. And yeah, so up to you guys. I, I think I, uh, I agree. I think the, you know, how, how you communicate to the public is quite important as well because just the fact and figure doesn't really capture attention or, you know, like people get emotionally um, excited. Yeah. But just let's say, like, for my papers, say, talk about like what 96% declines of sharks in 2005 to 2014. Nobody reads that, and that's really sad to me. It's really, it is really important, but like, scientists like, need to make it more accessible. Like, I think Ajahn Bun has been doing amazing work to make science like, accessible, like you do a talk, a video, but I, I, think, I think we need more of like, that kind of thing to come out. And actually, I think you are a like, conservation writer yourself. You should talk more about what you do. Can I throw it back into you? <laughs> no, I, I always believe that um, communication is really important, and especially people who work on the issue, you know, because we under understand the issue the best, so it's almost um, our responsibility as well to communicate to the public and make it um, accessible. I mean, one, one of my, um, probably my, um, sort of the thing that make I believe in the, you know, mobilize, mobilizing public support and also this day, you know, we, we live through social media and how we communicate and I think about five or six years ago, I started campaign on the parrot fish uh, consumption, you know, the retailer and also it's been very successful and I think that also proven the concept that if you have, have you know, the right information, you can, you know, put sort of in the digest format that make people understand you can really change some some really big um, policy because you know during that two months campaign I and you know other um, 
uh, researcher managed to convince all the major five retailers in Thailand to stop selling parrot fish, which is, you know, um, usually going to take years to come up with the law, with the public participation, but I think this kind of uh, era, you know, really allow you to communicate directly with, uh, with the consumer, with the public to come up with the right policy. Um, so maybe the last before we open to the floor, like also back to Kun Tuni as well, in terms of you also stress the importance of public awareness, but don't we hear enough bad news about, you know, like environment, but how we really have turned this public awareness to something um, we are science science policy agency, so we had difficulty before communicating, digesting scientific findings, to communicate to the policy people. And once it happened, we also have difficulty digesting policy language to different sector, so they understand. So my take would be any messages must connect you to the audience. The climate change never sells well if the climate change people keep talking about climate is changing you don't feel anything but they need they really need to either find someone or looking for help connect climate change to different sector to the fishing sector to the tourism sector to the industrial sector but it doesn't happen in thailand yet we have done some connecting uh, building sector to the climate change, and now we have four ongoing projects to make sure that we are building energy efficient housing, we are promoting uh, energy efficient uh, appliances, we, are, we don't yet want to promote that much of renewable energy because it's not yet circular economy. So we step back a bit, we keep promoting uh, energy efficiency. But, but we have difficulty communicating with energy people also. So we look for help, we digest the message, and then we uh, customize the message to the sector so they can quickly pick up. I think the important thing is like you must connect yourself to the, the audience, the target audience. Because environment is not single discipline, it's multidisciplinary. So that's the way. Thank you so much. Um, sorry I'm taking so much time with the speaker because they all have a very uh, interesting point of view. But I, 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 I have learned from the organizer that uh, French people have many questions. And I think it's time to open for the floor for any question or so maybe exchange of the idea. So please. Yes. Um, I think the microphone. Sorry, I'm not French, I'm Japanese. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when I'm in Japan, I'm involved with the uh, Coral Reef Conservation. Uh, I'm supporting citizen uh, science. I'm also guiding. Yeah, yeah. I'm oh, sorry, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not a copy. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, this time uh, we are uh, facing COVID situation. The we, yeah, last month I went to <coughs> uh, to get the sea is very beautiful, mm -hmm. thanks to less tourists. Yeah, and uh, I don't, yeah. yeah. I think uh, education is important, communication is very important, I understand. Yeah, I'm trying to communicate with it. But it takes time. The, the, uh, facing COVID situation, the restriction for tourists, it works. So how, what do you think to restrict numbers of tourists? Yeah, mm -hmm. we often hear about the uh, recent Thailand also facing uh, Okinawa in Japan experience over tourists mm -hmm. from China or mm -hmm. Korea. Yeah, mm -hmm. what do you think about yeah, how to balance tourism industry and marine conservation? Mm -hmm. Very good point, and I think that that. You know, the bottom line is that um, in the past, I think we overuse the resources, but how we can strike the balance. Um, we, we don't have the prime minister or the minister here yeah, on, the, on the panel, but if anyone like to make a point about his statement, please, please feel, feel free. 
Because is is it possible to say you know who get less half the number of tourists? Probably not, right? Or uh, once the the sky is open, I'm sure that the tourists are gonna return. Well, that's the thing. I mean, what when it all comes back to normal? Uh, if we start again like before, like in Phuket or BP, I mean now Maya Bay, Maya Bay been closed for two years, and then one the day they will reopen. Again, 5,000 people per day in the water, stepping on the coral. So, what's after? We had the, another example three years ago in the Philippines, Boracay Island. The government decided to close it down completely. No money giving back to every hotel whatsoever. Closed down for one year to reduce all the sewage system. So, if we wait too much, then governments will close down. Maybe government will close down Patron one day or Pattaya one day to just do, and they've done it in Boraca in the Philippines, they've done it in Maya Bay. If you ask me five years ago, do you think the government will ever close Maya Bay? I would have said never, you know? But they did it, and it's very good, and they should not reopen it. It should, it should stay closed. So tourism and ocean conservation is complicated. And in my case, for example, our foundation, we started this foundation with the tourism industry because we believe that the tourism industry is the key player and should be the key player in ocean conservation. Uh, you guys live in Bangkok, every time you take the highway, you stop by the toll gate, you pay money. That money is used to maintain the highway. Hotels, in the tropics, the Caribbean, the Maldives, Bali, Phuket, the main asset of the hotel industries in Phuket is the ocean. People come to Phuket to swim in the ocean. The main asset is not uh, the landscape or the food or the temples, it's the ocean. Now, hotels have to pay nothing to the ocean. It's free of charge. They get swim, snorkel, kayak. They have to pay zero to maintain the ocean. It's the best asset ever in business, it costs zero to any hotel. So what we're trying to do is to, and in that way, we try to motivate the hotel industry to support us in creating projects in the tourism industry to involve the public. Like this project, for example, the seagrass nursery we have, to help uh, nature in growing the, the seeds of the seagrass, replanting them with the guests of each hotel where we can do that to support, to help the nature so we can expand the area of the seagrass so important because seagrass produce 70% of the oxygen we breathe, not the Amazon. And this is how we can involve the people, make them aware of why is it important and this is how we think tourism should involve. It should bring the people to help while they're on holiday instead of sending their kids to the kids club playing on Nintendo, send their kids to become a junior marine biologist. So this is how we think the tourism industry should be evolved together with to help the ocean conservation. Mm. I think that that should be part of this kind of new normal, right? Because Probably realistically, we cannot have the number of tourists, uh, tourists that are coming in, but what we can do is really uh, a more strict measure and also increase capacity to deal with the problem, whether it's wastewater, whether it's uh, marine plastic. Any? I think this uh, question can be another one big discussion panel by itself, because like, it's just how deep of this rabbit hole you want to go into like internal policy and how not only it, it's I think this discussion is gonna be related to not only it, it is more than just the Ministry of Environment it's become like how the direction of the TAT Tourism Authority of Thailand been trying to attract uh, tourists from some specific groups of countries they have mm -hmm. in the past in the past like I think like we say almost ha half a decade their movement uh, the way they promote things so mm -hmm. it's a big rabbit hole and in terms of like how the our money inside the national crowd being used for 
conservation. So it's going to be a long, long, long discussion. Okay, I have to stop the speaker because we want to hear more from the floor. <laughs> please, the, the question and the feedback. Please. Hi, um, sorry. My name is Penny. Uh, I'm also not French. Um, I'm representing WWF Thailand. Um, approaching what we're discussing at the moment on um, a policy and, 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 a, and a, a regulations, a regulatory perspective, one thing that I'd like to highlight is that uh, it is true, and I very much agree that um, it's very difficult to translate um, environmental issues into, um, you know, a, a, a national policy level. Uh, particularly when environmental issues has never been a priority issue in this country, um, especially during this time when COVID has become the main priority as well as the political movement that goes on. However, what I'd like to highlight over here is that um, the government cannot deny the fact that tourism is the main source of income and that has affects a lot of people um, especially at the local level. Um, coming from a, a, a legal as well as a, a policy background, what I find is that um, perhaps um, implementing agencies, um, like-minded implementing agencies, will need to um, discuss with uh, the government on how sustainability as well as um, environmental issue goes hands in hand and how it affects um, uh, the, the the local on how they they money out their their incomes. So I think this is something that has uh, not been discussed, and this is one thing that WWF Thailand is also trying to work on in terms of how to highlight and link in between. If there is a major um, impact on the environment, and that would definitely affect people. Of course, COVID has now affecting a lot of people, particularly in the tourism sector. But if um, the env environment, uh, envi environmental impact um, also creates that, what will happen? What would entails to people within this business as well? Or people in the diving industry will not get a lot of customers, not a lot of tourists, because it's not attractive enough, right? We've seen a lot of um, cases around the world whereby um, tour, uh, uh, tourism has provided a lot of impact on the environment and that has reduced the number of tourists. So I think this is something that if we join, um, jointly try to highlight that, um, it would definitely be, be a key point for all of us to discuss with um, the government. Also, another thing is that I'd like to, to add on is I very much agree on what Dr. Pitt uh, mentioned earlier that um, the policy that also lacks right now is the extended producer responsibilities. Of course, this is not only, um, we're not trying to pinpoint that producers are the only stakeholders that's playing an important part on, on um, fixing this plastic pollution problem of um, marine debris. But at the same time, we also see that um, the EPR principle would definitely help um, promote circular economy for the entire supply chain. So this is something that's also WWF is also working on too. Um, another thing that I'd like to particularly ask Dr. Christian, with this is the very last um, point, is that in terms of the waste management policy on the municipality and the local level, what is it? that you find is still a gap that um, very much an issue to for, for people like us to drive on the policy? Is it lack of um, the number of, of human resources? Or is it lack of funding? What is the key issue of policy that you see? Thank you. Thanks for your questions. Um, about the government, I would like to highlight that um, being a ministry for environment is never easy, I mean, anywhere in the world. And um, it seems that uh, the Ministry of Environment in Thailand is quite very active. 
but uh, he cannot do anything when he's not alone. I mean, he can impulse quite many things, but at the same time, alone he cannot do much. And uh, because when we, you talk about environment, obviously it's not only environment, but it's also tourism, and tourism ministry can have a different perspective on the things. Uh, but also what about agriculture, industry, uh, trade, uh, all these uh, ministries actually need to work online. Um, and I don't want to, to make any advertising that would be uh, not very relevant, but just to, to mention that a few days ago uh, in France uh, was uh, reactivated uh, a powerful instrument that France used to have for a very long time, that is the High Commissariat for planning. And this is exactly for that. This is for, because environment is not only environment, but actually all the topics, all the crises we could face is not only about one ministry, it's about all the sectors, all ministries. And so it was, uh, it was done for that. Um, then I will let the, the talk. But for the second point, what is lacking, um, for instance, at local level, from what I've seen, there is often, uh, uh, there can be a gap between human resources at national level, I mean, in, um, within the central government or around the central government, you can have uh, very highly qualified people. And then further you go uh, in the country, and um, and yes, you, you 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 meet people with um, not so high qualification, but also uh, with um, uh, also everyone should know something nowadays about climate change and uh, environmental threats. But it's, uh, surprisingly, maybe you still find many civil servants, even decision makers, even. Uh, uh, employees working for the private sector who has um, who have uh, little knowledge about the the topics linked to climate change and especially about <clears throat> the ways of coping with the threats, coping with or uh, mitigating the threats. Uh, they don't know that uh, they have tools to 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 work on the on uh, uh, water, I mean the way of planning territory, you, uh, through that lens for instance, you can do already many things, not the only one, but already many things. So, uh, but I want to share the, the floor. Can I add two sentences about yeah. um, tourists and the government, I know two of you raised, and unfortunately in the past the government always think about the um, quantities of the tourists, the number of the tourists, but now uh, actually they realize that the qualities of the tourists is, can make a difference and um, from what I know now, they will get into that. The qualities of the tourists uh, come first. Uh, they're willing to pay more, double or triple, um, rather than, you know, pay the cheap one. So what, what I would like to share with you that the government probably going to go get into that. I was thinking you're opening it. It's really true. That the, and the, sort of the reason why I love is that, yeah, that's all true, and it takes us a while, but the time has really come, huh? so it's a good thing. Okay, quick quick one. Really quick. Uh, maybe as of now, you can use Samui as an example. Before, for even for the Thai, it's like this much, and now once it's got this much, many Thai can afford, so we go. So I hope the government realize to increase the, not, not the price, but the value of our natural resources that support our local economy this much, so that already screen out some people and we will have quality tourists. Thank you. I have been um, signaled by organizer that um, sadly we, we, we have been, you know, um, talking too much. <laughs> <laughs> Getting long, getting late, and um, so it, ha it has been an in very uh, fruitful discussion. I feel, and I think we, we could talk all night. And I mean, if we are using French time, we could have 
supper at 10, right? <laughs> but now it's um, uh, uh, 20 to 9, so I guess also we have a beautiful reception after the uh, panel discussion as well. So I'm, I'm really sorry for the people who haven't got a chance to ask questions, but I think we will be uh, talking and better drinking and discuss more, I think maybe even more fruitful with the wine. Um, so with that, I think I, I would like to you know, thank all the panelists. I think there's a lot of food for thought for today. Uh, we touched on some really big issue about you know, the, the, the direction of the new normal, how to really set the sea, and also particularly I think coral reef, which to me is also a very iconic ecosystem. If we can save coral reef, I feel we can save ourselves. But if we cannot, I think the meaning is go the other way as well. So um, it's a lot of food for thought here, and I hope you continue this discussion after the session. So thank you very much, everyone.